Lord, Alpha and Omega, the author and the finisher of your faith. Celebrate the King of Kings. Hallelujah. 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 Stay in that offering of praise. Stay in that offering of praise. No matter what you're going through, no matter what it looks like, you stay in that offering of praise this morning. You stay in that. Resurrection power is operating in every life in this room. Everything that needs to get up out of the grave must come up right now in the name of Jesus. I command it right now in the name of Jesus. Prophesy to yourself this morning. You have the power of the living God on the inside of you. You tell that thing, whatever it is, to get up. My children must get up. My husband, my wife, whatever it is. My finances have to get up. My healing has to get up. My confidence in Jesus has to get up. Get up this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We know who we are in the King. Hallelujah. Come on, let's stay there.
ever before your throne. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. 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 We celebrate you, Jesus. Thank you.
You're worth it, Jesus. You're worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it to trust him. It's worth it to serve him and his people. It's worth it. Better than anything in this life. It's worth it. If you don't know him, if you don't know him, you ought to know him today because it's worth it. Our lives are better because of Jesus. Our lives are better because of the Lord. And no matter what we're going through, I'd rather go through it with Jesus. Because I know he's got it in his hands. Oh, it's worth it. Tell the Lord this morning, it's worth it. It's worth it to serve you, Father. It's worth it to work with you. It's worth it to praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It doesn't have to be a song. Sometimes you just need to say it. It's worth it, Jesus. It's worth it. Thank you, Jesus. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Hallelujah. It's worth it. Hallelujah. It's worth it. Some of you have been standing for a long time. It's worth it. It's worth it to still keep confessing the word. It's still worth it. To get in your Bible every day. It's still worth it. To praise him in your home. It's still worth it. It's still worth it. It's still worth it. It's still worth it to give him your best. It's still worth it to serve the Lord. you <laughs> 
Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Thank you, Jesus, we love you. Thank you, God.
your holy name for you alone are worthy to be praised we magnify your name this day we give you all the praise all the glory all the honor all the adoration all the thanksgiving all the majesty it is all due you father we thank you for this day especially, the day in which we, more than any other day, because Father, we celebrate our risen King every day, but on this day in particular, we are reminded of his work, his work at Calvary to reconcile us back to you. Now, Father, you had no desire for your creation to remain lost and so you sent the very best of yourself your son Jesus to take away the sin of the world so that we could be one with you so that we could be your righteousness so father we just thank you we thank you for it we thank you that we're gathered here this day we thank you that we're gathered in this place for worship for word for fellowship to edify to exhort, to comfort one another and to be edified, exhorted and comforted by your word and by your spirit whom we know is present with us. So Holy Spirit, as always, these proceedings belong to you. Think through my mind, speak through my lips, the illumination of the revelation of God. May it go forth to meet the needs of the people spirit soul and body and I know you'll see to it that the word goes forth with clarity unhindered and unchecked by any unseen or opposing forces because those forces have been neutralized rendered ineffective as a result of the finished work of Christ at Calvary and it's in that finished work that we do rest for we have entered into your rest father and there we remain and where we remain is everything we need that pertains to life and godliness experiencing your shalom Nothing missing, nothing broken, walking in the fullness of your blessing, flourishing in every aspect of our lives as our souls flourish. And so I thank you for your peace. In, in the turmoil that is going on in this world, Father, we thank you for your peace. All the hell and heinous acts of the adversary, and yet we find ourselves at peace, Father. And it's your peace that will let reign in our hearts. It's your peace that surpasses all understanding that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When anxiety comes, when worry comes, when the cares of the world come, Father, we say no. We say no to holding on to them. We give them to you. We cast them on you by faith. We go to you in prayer and supplication and make our requests known to you. We thank you, Father. We don't have to worry about our lives. We take no thought. We seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing everything we need will be added to us. You are Jehovah Shalom, our peace. You are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. Every need is met according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And you sent your word and healed us. You took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. By your stripes we were healed. It is done. It is settled according to your word. No sickness, no disease has any legal right in this place. In the lives of the believers in this place, those watching online at home, we thank you that we are the healed. That you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. And Father, we thank you this day that the hearts are ready. The ground is prepared. The seed of the word will be sown and it will produce in our lives. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Good morning, family. How you guys doing today? 
good. Well, we would like to welcome any first time visitors that are here for the very first time joining us today. Would you please just stand, wave to us. We just wanna see where you are. We just wanna greet you. I see some hands over here. Awesome. Some back there in the back. Oh, right here in the front. Welcome, welcome, nice. Okay, I see you guys back there. Well, we just wanna say welcome to the Faith Dome. Thank you for joining us here today in service, and we hope and pray that it will be a blessing to you. Now, how many of you are here for the first time because it's Easter? Oh, you went there. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was hesitating. You were going there a little bit. Uh, you decided to do that. <laughs> because I wanted to tell them, please come back again. Don't let this be the first and last time we see you in the Faith Dome. See, I wasn't gonna rag too bad. No, no, good, good. I just wanna add to that on a more serious note. How many of you, maybe you have been at home most of the time and there is no judgment there, but Resurrection Sunday was the catalyst to get you back out. Okay, nice. good, there okay. we go. Outstanding. Thank you for being our online you're here. family still and then coming today. Thank you. Okay, couple of, nope, they said it was a video. Right. New, new for 2023, audio and video messages are now available on USB drives. Pricing is the same as current CDs and DVDs, but now you'll be able to play them using current technology. USB drives will be available both online in the faithdome.org cyber store and in the CCC bookstore. Get yours today. Welcome to ever increasing faith. Okay, could you guys hear what the video said? Okay, so I really feel like I shouldn't have to say that again. But okay, I'm gonna be obedient. Congregation, for your ever increasing access to the teachings of our very own Dr. Frederick Casey Price. Oh, wait a minute. Very own Dr. Frederick K. Price. We now offer audio messages for our Sunday worship service on USB. The pricing is still the same as the CDs, and you have access to a more current technology. USBs are available in the bookstore and our online store at faithdome.org. All the new teachings are being converted to this new technology, so keep your eyes open. All right, USB, we're advancing forward in technology. How many of you still speak VHS and cassette tape? Anyone? No? A-track, beta? No. Have, we, have we moved on to... Are we you still on compact disc or digital video disc? Okay, all right. Compact disc. Yeah, CD players, Walkmans, in my walk boom boxes, you guys. Okay. Okay. I don't I can't you found it? I can't tell you the last time I held a disc. I don't even know what they feel like anymore. But thank God that there are a number of ways by which we can hear the gospel, receive the gospel, but I'd like some of you to, to go on and graduate, so. <laughs> All right, today is family day here in the Faith Dome. Please ensure that your children and teens are in service with you as we fellowship. Also, Ms. Mrs. Angela Evans invites you to join neurologists, doctors Dean and Aisha Sherzai for an insightful brain and health lecture. Also, a Q&A session will be here in the Faith Dome on Saturday, April 29th at 10 a.m. For more information about brain health and how to prevent Alzheimer's disease, click on the QR code on the screen. And those are our quick announcements. Pastor. Thank you, Lady Angel. Crenshaw Christian Center continues its 50-year celebration with special guest speaker, Dr. Philip Goudeau, live in the Faith Dome on April 23rd. Everything, everything starts changing in your life when you put God as a priority in your life. Join in person or watch online as Dr. Philip Goudeau returns to the Faith Dome on April 23rd. Don't miss it.
right. The 50-year celebration continues with Dr. Godot. So we look forward to hearing him later on this month. Before we get into giving, I do want to acknowledge someone uh, about a year, literally one year before dad departed uh, for his eternal vacation. Uh, the devil was just being busy and tried to take my mother-in-law out, but he failed. And my mother-in-law is in service today. Mama Cynthia and, and her caretaker, Dad Brown, has been doing a great job of taking care of his, the love of his life. So, and it's so good to see him in service. All right. And now it is time to give. It is time to sow on Resurrection Day. Happily and cheerfully on Resurrection Day. God loves a cheerful giver. Happy and hilarious giver. And so there are many ways you can display that. But bottom line, the condition of your heart should be joy when it's time to sow. Because ultimately we know that we are sowing towards the cause of Christ in the earth realm. Now, God is so awesome. He, he blesses us in return for our sowing into good ground. And as I said, when the condition of our heart is correct, Jesus said, give and it shall be given. Not might, not maybe, but it will be given when you give. He also teaches about the, the proper ground to sow in. We want to make sure we're sowing into good ground. But when we give into good ground, we do reap the corresponding return. And Paul also says this, whatever one sows, so shall that one reap, knowing that we'll reap in due season. How about this? Let's declare right now that today is due season. We will reap in due season. Watch this. If we faint not and we do not lose heart, he says, let's not grow weary. And it is tempting to do that. But let's not grow weary in our good deeds, the doing of our good deeds. Many ways that you can give. Those ways will be on the screen in just a second. But if you're ready, let's lift our gifts up to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus. He'll take them, worship the Father on our behalf. I'll pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to sow towards your kingdom causes. We count it an honor and privilege to be what you call us, workers together with you, fellow workers, the laborers going forth into the plentiful harvest, spreading the message of our living Savior and seeing to it that that message goes forth into this dying world. And I thank you that as we give this day, according to what we have as we purpose in our heart, doing so cheerfully that we will reap the corresponding manifold return on our giving in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. Okay, we're going to move on into healing. If there are those present with us and you'd like hands laid on you, the Bible says that believing ones will lay hands on the sick. There are the sick and then there are those dealing with sickness. All right, let's get into the habit. When it comes to believers, believers are not sick. Believers are not the sick. Believers may be contending with sickness. Sickness may be trying to creep and lord itself over the life of us as believers, but according to the covenant, we are the healed. Let us not forget that. So if you're in this place, those of you at home, you can receive at home as well. But if you're in this place, you want hands laid on you, come forward right now. Follow the leading of the ushers. Come and receive your healing. Your bed, 
This is a call to the heavy laden. This is a call to the weak in spirit. Get up and lift up your head. Cause you are settle that now Jesus is the healer he's just using me I'm not I'm not the healer I'm just gonna lay my hands on you let me tell you where my faith is my faith is in when I lay my hands on you you receive your faith should be when hands are laid on you you receive Jesus already did the work I'm gonna pray and we're gonna move from there in the congregation stretch your hands for adding your faith to those who have come forward and even those around you maybe there are those around you that did not come forward but are looking to receive they can as well father we thank you for your word on healing we've called your covenant name already Jehovah Rapha the Lord our healer and so we thank you that healing is available that we can access healing by faith we can access what's already done by the stripes of Jesus by faith and it's the prayer of faith that we are to pray in which you said would heal the sick spirit soul and body you said the elders of the church would lay hands on them and you Lord you would raise them up you said believing ones would lay hands on the sick and lay hands on those dealing with some type of sickness and they would recover so I thank you that when I lay my hands on them the recovery process begins the healing process begins in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. that by his stripes every stripe you are healed if hands were laid on you and there is a difference now the pain is gone the pain is departing the heaviness is departing stand up wherever you are wave your hands or if you can't stand wave your hands or if you just received where you were you didn't come forward but you received wave your hands at us we want to look at what the Lord has done what he's doing and what he's done I see a number of hands over here about five or six over here two over here one two three four about six hands over here amen couple hands over here all right stay in faith without faith it is what it is God is not a respecter of persons but he is a respecter of faith so let's stay in faith we are going to
We'll take that one. Let's hear what the Spirit of the Lord would say on Resurrection Sunday. And then when the word is received, in the name of Jesus, it'll be received. And we'll have ministry and song, and then I will return. So. the Lord this is the word of the Lord to this house I can't do nothing with your silence I need your mouths and I need volume in your mouths the devil the defeated one has had his way in the lives of my sheep and my lambs in areas that I died to prevent them from experiencing. But I need a shout, said the Lord. Even as in the days of Jehoshaphat, when the people said, the Lord is good, bless the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever, the Lord sent ambushments. Before he sent the army, he sent ambushments, and the, and the ambushments caused the enemies to turn against themselves. The things in your lives that you've been too tolerant about, either materially, regarding your health, regarding your children, you ain't been noisy enough. Make some noise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen, listen. Not just in this house. Yes. Do it in your own house. Yes. Don't do it for the eyes of ears of others. Yes. Do it in your own house. I can personally testify to this. I see the glory of God on my sons because I've always shouted to the Lord regarding them. Shout to the Lord. The angels of the Lord are hovering here. They're here whether you know it or not. And they are assigned to bring the kingdom of God into our lives. But they need to hear, watch this, they need to hear you say what God says in the face of what the devil's saying to you. God wants you noisy. God wants you loud. Y'all should know Brother Rich by now. I don't have a problem with being loud. But we ain't talking about personality here. I'm loud in the spirit. Shout to the Lord, come out of your ordinary. Come out of your composure. But watch this. I know where it's at in the Bible where it says be decent and in order. Regarding this, be disorderly. Because your praise will disperse the demons in your lives. And the devils that's been assigned to your life, the angels are mightier than them. Now I got to demonstrate something. The Spirit of God told me to do this. Mother, sin. Brother Charles, this couple deposited it in my life when I was a babe in the Lord. And I'm going to deposit something in your life now. And the Lord told me to tell you, you're going to feel a difference. And it's going to be the initial thing. Jesus paid for this. But he wants you to become violent. He wants you to become violent over her. And tell the devil, no. No. I ain't tolerating this. He got on that cross and paid for it. I ain't tolerating this. And when you get like that, the scripture says, the devil will flee from you. I don't need to put my hands on you. I'm putting a shout on you by the word of the Lord. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. You're going to feel a tingling. You're going to feel something initial to signify this word to you. God's timing is meticulously, it's meticulous. I didn't come in with this word for you today from my house. 
I got it when I saw you come in the door, God spoke it to me. And said, say it to her. She deposited into your life. You took me into your arms as a son when he was drawing me up in the faith. And I was working with him in that prison ministry. That deposited, that deposited has blessed my house and my son's house. And there's a prophetic voice in this house. I'm assigned to it. And to the rest of y'all, don't tolerate by the end of this year, don't be the same. Financially, with your health, ain't nothing that your mouth can't disperse. But you, you, you literally got to be wholly angry. You got to get wholly hostile. And say, no, devil, no. Jesus paid the price. And you walk through that house doing it. No, devil. No. No, devil, no. Yeah, you're going to look insane. You're going to look ridiculous. But watch your results, says the Lord. into the presence of God by worship through song. The Bible talks about the gifts operating, the charismata, the spirit-filled church should see that and experience that globally. And we believe in the operation of the gifts found in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, the vocal gifts specifically as a word of prophecy went forth. That should bring about edification, exhortation, and comfort. I want to I wanna highlight the timeliness of and the relevancy of shouting. That was an on-time word. And, and I do love that the Spirit of God said that it should not just be done here, but wherever you are. Even when no one is looking, get violent. But I, I want to, I want to address one part, and I, I, I believe because I choose to be optimistic with my faith that what Brother Richard said about not being decently, he meant to be decently, meaning because all things are to be done decently and in order doesn't matter what it is. I believe these superlatives are being used to articulate how wild we need to get in our worship and in our shout. But still, let all things be done decently and in order. And for the word to mom, I know she receives that. And, uh, and I, I concur with the, with the, the initial Whatever that tingle she is feeling or will feel is the jumping off point to what's going to come next. So hallelujah for that. And now let's be led into worship. Let's prepare our hearts. The atmosphere will be set and I will return. Calling me out of the 
dark The night cannot whisper what he said to light He is my firm foundation My anchor won't be moved The storms may collide but my soul is on fire with his word Say we listen to the power on our lips.
that after the word went forth the praise team seemed a little more excited than usual and I, I see why now because that song was in direct harmony with that word that song was about speaking to mountains and giants and with the words of our mouth words in harmony with the word those mountains will move and those giants will fall. So, the violent, I need to teach on that scripture. We have to remember that the, the precious Lamb of God is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And we know that he's the Prince of Peace, but he also said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And sometimes you got to pull that sword out. All right. Find Acts 12. I can never do a resurrection message justice on a Sunday. I don't have enough time. So I just have to give you little bits and pieces um, and ultimately talk about the most important thing, and that is our risen Lord. Tuesday night Bible study, I'll begin a new lesson on Hala Holy Days and what we as believers are to do with some of the most prominent ones, Easter being one. And in Acts chapter 12, we'll see a word here that while accurate in the Greek is not accurate in its English translation in every version of scripture. But here in, here in Acts 12, Acts 12, find verse 1. When you have it, say, I have it. And I will I'll begin reading here. It says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Here you have, a, you have an opposing ruling figure making it his, his goal and his aim to do what? Harass the church. 
Do not be caught off guard when authoritative figures in our land and in our world make it their priority to harass the church. But we must remain firm, church. Verse 2, then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, verse 4, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads or quaternions, if you have a traditional King James Version. Four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Now, the Greek word here is Pascha, which is the word Passover. But for some strange and odd reason, the traditional King James Version uses the word Easter. And let me be very clear, Easter is not Passover. Passover is not Easter. Neither was Passover influenced by Easter. Okay, the Passover was instituted in Exodus 12. You all may remember Exodus 12 when, when God said to Moses, when he said to the leadership of Israel, he said, this month is the beginning of your months, Israel. And the Passover was then instituted. And we know the Passover was given a new, new meaning by way of our Savior, what we know and, and refer to as the Last Supper. Uh, when we're receiving communion. Uh, but Jesus was the fulfillment of Passover. Jesus actually is our, our Passover. Um, and, and because we're now under the New Testament, the, the requirement, I want to stress that word, requirement and obligation to participate in the Passover the way it was instituted under the Old Covenant is not necessary it's not something we have to do but I, I would encourage everyone to experience it at least once or experience a Seder at least once um, but as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ we are under the law of liberty and I want to briefly talk about what that means for you and I while the word Easter once again does not mean Passover while Easter is technically not a Christian celebration, it's not a Christian holiday, it, it's actually pagan. Uh, it was named after Ostara, who was the Anglo-Saxon goddess of the spring. Now, what is a Christian, what is a believer to do with this celebration? You are at liberty to make that decision. If you don't want to celebrate Easter, don't celebrate Easter. If you would like to participate in Easter, guess what? You actually have the liberty to participate in Easter. And that includes the pink, that includes the bunnies, and the eggs, and the limited edition candy that is released on this specific holiday. You have the liberty to do that. Now, some would say, Pastor, how could you say that? Easter is pagan and we should not participate in anything that is pagan, which if you would like to live that way, you need to stop living. <laughs> and if you are one who shouts from the rooftops that a believer should not celebrate, you should not, not it's your choice to bypass it, but you are dogmatic about it and believe that all believers who pro profess the name of the Lord Jesus should not participate in any facet of Easter, and you might throw Christmas in there as well and some other holidays as well, that's fine. Do you. Just make sure I never, ever hear out of your mouth the days of the week or the months of the year because they're all named after pagan gods too. And don't get me started on all of the pagan elements of the society that we live in that many of us participate, both willingly and unwillingly. Some of us drive cars that were named after pagan gods. So before you go lording your personal beliefs about Easter and any other holiday over believers, make sure you check your own hypocritical paganism. Make sure you do that. 
Now, once again, let me be clear. Easter's not Christian. Easter's not Passover. And actually, as believers, we celebrate resurrection. But watch this. You know, I've never said this before. And this, this, uh, this applies to Christmas as well. You know, there's no New Testament commandment to celebrate either. There's no scripture or verse in the New Testament that commands us to celebrate the birth of Christ. Although, why wouldn't we? There is no, there is no, no commandment or scripture that requires us to celebrate his resurrection around this time. Although, why wouldn't we? As a matter of fact, when you live the life of a believer 24-7, you are celebrating both his birth and his resurrection. You are celebrating why he came into this world and you are celebrating and living out why he died and why he conquered death. But this word here is Passover, Acts 12, 4. If you see the word Easter, it's not Easter, it's Passover. I want to be very clear about that. Now, look at Romans 14. Romans 14, and find verse 1. There were some very strong positions that even I held when it came to what a believer is allowed to do or should do when it comes to certain what we would call secular holidays. Uh, but as I've continued to study both the Word and things outside of Scripture, I've realized that there is a balance that we as believers must live in this world. And Easter, for example, if, if today, later on, you participate in an Easter egg hunt, your salvation is not in question. It's, it's not in question. If it's in question, then our salvation is in question every day. But let me not get into that. We don't have time for that. Tune in to Tuesday nights, and I have all the time in the world. I'm going to walk us through a number of things. Romans 14, look at verse 1. It says, receive one who is weak in the faith. What did he say? He said, receive one who is what? Who is weak in the faith. Now, when you hear weak in the faith, what do you think of? This is my first thought. My first thought in this context is not necessarily someone whose faith is low when it comes to activating it or believing God for something. When I read weak in the faith here, I, I have the understanding that we're talking about a neophyte in Christ, a, 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 a newborn babe in Christ. So he says, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes. Don't receive one to disputes. Over what? Doubtful things. Christians are always wasting a lot of time arguing, hinging people's salvation over doubtful things. Things that one cannot be completely certain of. It's your opinion, and we like to put our opinions on other believers, especially when they're weak in the faith, because we know we can mold them and shape them into our image. Well, that's idolatry, so you might want to check that. He says, verse 2, for one believes, now he uses an example, and he likes to use food. Paul uses food because we can all relate to food. We, we, we can relate to food. Some of you have, have decided in your life there is a dietary direction you're going to pursue moving forward. Bless you for that. More power to you. Uh, some of you have decided to go off of something just for a short window of time, maybe to correct uh, your insides with, with, the, with the calendar date established as to when you'll return to some of those things. But Paul uses food because it's something we can all relate to. So look at what he says here. Verse 2, he says, for one believes he may eat all things. See, that's me. But one who is weak eats only vegetables. Now, this doesn't mean that if you're a vegetarian, you're weak. 
Remember, what we're talking about here is a newborn babe in Christ. And sometimes newborn babes, um, yeah, they, they, can, they can get a hold of the word they don't understand and they run amok. Mature believers need to corral them and arrest them and, 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 and teach them. Verse 3, let not him who despises him who does not eat. Let not him, let not him who eats despise him who doesn't eat. All right, so if I eat more than vegetables and you don't, the scripture is saying, let not me despise you. And then look at the second part, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. Paul's real clear about this. If you're, if you're vegetarian or fruititarian or pescatarian or vegan, do you. And I won't judge you, but when you see these pork chops, this bacon the, on my plate, don't judge me. And I like eating vegan, and I like vegetables, and I like fruit, and I like fish, but I like the swine as well. And don't try to hit me with some old covenant law, Leviticus scripture. Because I'll eat you alive, and we don't want to do that now. <laughs> Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. God's received them both. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. As children of God under the new covenant, we are servants of God, and our master will judge us. Now, I had to read those four verses to get to this fifth verse, since we're talking about holidays, specifically Easter being today. Look at verse 5. One person esteems one day above another. One person esteems one day above another. One person will separate a day from the rest. A lot of us do that. It's called a birthday. We also do it on our anniversary. We also do it on Mother's Day. We also do it on Father's Day. We esteem one day above the other. We separate one day from the rest. So one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. One person may say, you know what? They're all just days. And if that's you, cool. Don't judge us for esteeming a day above the other. It says, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. So whatever it is you do believe, you better be fully convinced. And he says, he who observes the day, what? observes it to the Lord. This is what it means to be under the law of liberty as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, especially if we truly believe that this is the day the Lord has made. When is that applicable? Is that only applicable on Sundays? Did, did, the, did the Lord only make the first day of the week and the seventh or Sabbath day? Are the other days in between also the Lord's day? Are those also the days the Lord has made and we should rejoice and be glad in all seven days of the week? Verse 6 again, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. It's really that simple. Now watch this. It is believed that Paul is specifically talking about a particular day. With that day being the most holy day during a week to Jews. Which means that if Paul, now there's nothing in the scripture that says he's talking about the Sabbath, but if he is talking about the Sabbath, that means every other day comes under the Sabbath. So if Paul is saying what? If Paul is saying one person may esteem the Sabbath, because in 2023, you have people out there in the sea, the 
endless sea of social media with all of the self-proclaimed experts on particular subject matter related to scripture. Many will tell you that we should be observing the Sabbath, and if we're not, we're disobeying God. Now, let me be the first to tell you that we should Sabbath. Matter of fact, statistics show that Seventh-day Adventists live longer than the rest of us. True. Sadly, though, they observe the Sabbath not by way of liberty, but because they believe it is an obligation, which decimates our liberty in Christ. Consider this. The weak thought some days were more important than others, given the Jewish background here, Paul being a Jew. The day that is supremely in view is certainly the Sabbath. The strong think every day is the same. Those of us who are mature in the Lord know that Jesus basically said, you who are heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you Sabbath. I'll give you rest. Ladies and gentlemen, when we enter into Christ, we enter into his Sabbath. The strong think every day is the same. Both views are permissible. That's another advantage of having liberty in Jesus. So if you want to get together with your fellow believers on a Saturday, go for it. And let me make sure as one who assembles on a Sunday, let me make sure that I don't judge the ones who assemble on a Saturday. But the ones who assemble on a Saturday need to also make sure they're not judging the ones who assemble on a Sunday. Because the Bible refers to the first day of the week as the Lord's day. That's the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ. So, both views are permissible. Each person must follow his own conscience. What is remarkable is that the Sabbath is no longer a binding commitment for Paul, but a matter of one's personal conviction. Unlike the other nine commandments, the Sabbath commandment seems to have been part of the ceremonial laws. It's not a moral issue. It's not an issue of morality. You know, like, don't murder that dude. Like, don't lie. Don't covet. Those are issues of morality. The Sabbath is not. The Sabbath would have been part of the ceremonial laws of the Mosaic Covenant, even though it existed before the covenant was fully established. Like the dietary laws and the laws about sacrifices, all of which are no longer binding on new covenant believers. No longer binding. That's our liberty in Christ. But it is wise to take regular times of rest from work and regular times of worship are commanded for Christians. We should take time to rest and we should take time to worship, but we are not bound by the Mosaic law. Let's be very clear about that. So when it comes to any holiday in actuality, you have the liberty to participate in that if you choose to. There are some that I don't participate in. There are some that I don't allow my children to participate in. Now, when they get older, they will have the choice and the decision to participate or not in said holidays. But when it comes to certain ones, as for me in my house, you all know the rest. But I'm not judging anyone for what they do or what they practice. Because if I, if I judge you on that, I got to judge me. And I would have to judge me first. And trust me, when it comes to all of the pagan stuff, everybody in some way is celebrating something pagan. You are. The way that it has no effect on you is that you're not doing it unto anything or anyone else except the Lord. Make your way to John. This will be the last thing that I say about this. There were times where God, and I honestly don't know why he did it. The only answer that I can come up with is he's God. Like that's all I have. I don't have anything else. His ways are higher. His thoughts are high. There are, there are. If you go to Deuteronomy, you don't have to go there now, but if you go to Deuteronomy 12, verses 1 through 4, God, it's like he has an attitude. He's like, don't you dare worship me with that pagan mess. Burn the altars, burn the poles, burn the trees. Get rid of it all. Get it out of the land. 
He's real adamant there. But then there are times where he allows something. And once again, I don't know why he does. I don't know why. I mean, he told Israel, be separate. And yet, most people don't know this. Places like Jerusalem and Bethlehem were pagan Canaanite cities whose names were defined as unto pagan gods. And when God had his people Israel take that land, he didn't change the name. Doesn't the law of first mention kick in? God, why didn't you change the name? Now, he changed the meaning, but he didn't change the name. Why didn't he do that? Because he's God. I, I really don't know. But there are times. I think what it shows us is that there's a balance that we need to live out in this life. We can't be overly aggressive. Uh, I think it was dad. I don't know if anyone coined this before dad. I don't know if he got it from someone or if he coined this himself. But he used to always say, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. And there is a scripture that actually is in harmony with that. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Okay. Now, let's talk about what this day really is all about. Because the other stuff is actually futile. Like, none of you in here should ever get caught up in a four-hour argument about any of this stuff when it comes to food or holidays or anything like that. But if someone comes for your savior, you better go hard on them. Look at John 11. John 11, let's start with verse 1. We'll spend the rest of our time here. It says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany. Let me have that, dear. A certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany. The town of Mary and her sister who? Martha. We're familiar with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And it says it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sisters sent to him, sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Anyone ever had a loved one who is sick? Anyone have a loved one right now contending with sickness? See, these are, the, these are the points in which all of us as humans can relate to. Even unbelievers can relate to this. Those of us who are believers who may subscribe to a different view or orientation, but we do agree that Jesus is Lord, can relate to this. We have all had a loved one who was sick. Maybe they're with the Lord now. Maybe they received their healing in this life. And they're moving forward strong, stronger than, than ever before. And there are those of us who are right now dealing with or have a loved one contending with sickness. Verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, and I submit to you, we should all respond like this. Whenever we hear about a loved one who's sick, we sh the first thing we should say is what Jesus said right here. You get a phone call, you get a text, you get an email, whatever it is. You come into contact in person with someone and they inform you that someone you love is sick. We should all respond like this. This sickness is not to death. That's how we should respond. Now, every person is responsible for their own faith. But I'm saying this is how we should respond to that kind of news. This sickness is not to death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. In other words, what is Jesus saying? Through this ordeal, God will get the glory. Okay? Verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days 
in the place where he was, probably to allow them time to mourn, mourn and grieve. He stayed where he was two more days. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples then said to him, Rabbi, maybe you want to reconsider this. Being that, uh, the Jews sought to stone you. Now, Jesus could have easily responded with, yeah, but they can't kill me. Matter of fact, they can't kill me until I give them permission. He said that. Jesus said that. John 10. He said, I lay my life down. That's why every attempt to traverse the terrain of the gospel, they tried to stone him. They failed. They tried to seize him. They failed. One time, Jesus was so cold, and I wonder if he was laughing at him while he was walking past him. He probably wasn't because Jesus was selfless. That's why I didn't need to be anybody's savior or Messiah because I would have been clowning too much. They had him at the edge of a cliff. The Bible says he just walked through the midst of them. They said, they said, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you're going to go there again? And then Jesus answers with something that seems like it doesn't address what they brought up. But this also gives me an opportunity to touch on something that we all know is Good Friday. I'm going to tell you how Good Friday could work, and then I'll tell you how it doesn't. Okay. Jesus answered. Now, I, once again, he's so meticulous and methodical. Well, what did they ask him? Look at verse 8 again so that we can see what they asked him. And then let's all assume what his answer should have been or, or what your answer would have been. Because the question is in verse 8, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you're going there again? And the scripture says he answered, but this is his answer. Are there not 12 hours in the day? Okay, Jesus, where, where are you going with this? What, what, what? We brought up folk trying to kill you. What? He says, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble. Because he sees the light of this world. Oh, but if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. So his answer is, I'm not concerned about those who are seeking to stone me because I'm of the day. And those of us who are believers in him, we are of the day. We're not of the night. L let me specify what that means because... Some of us go out to dinner at night. Some of us go to the movies at night. Some of us work at night. So what does Jesus mean? Here's what he's talking about. In this day, the night, as a matter of fact, let me, let me read you the Bible definition of this word night so that you can have a frame of reference for how the night was viewed way back then. This is what it means. The night, automatically the night means this, the time when work ceases. See, working at night, that wasn't, that's, 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 that's a new thing. Working at night is a new thing. They didn't work at night then. Night also was the time of death. Night also was the time for deeds of sin and shame. The night was also the time of moral stupidity and darkness. The night was also the time when the weary and the drunken ones would give themselves over to slumber. The night was when criminal activity occurred. The night was when your assassins and your thieves' guilds would do their dirt under cover and shadow of night. In the daytime, we were civilized. In, in the daytime, we worked. That's why when the day of Pentecost had fully come, 
And they were praying in the spirit, and you had Jews downstairs saying, they only speak one language. How come I can hear them magnifying God in my language? They were in awe. They marveled at it. But then you had a group of Pharisees, because there's always a group of haters. There's always a group of naysayers. And they were saying, ah, they're just drunk. And Peter said, y'all know that's not the case, because we don't. I mean, y'all don't get drunk during the third hour of the day. In other words, it was 9 a.m. Peter said, you all know, folk don't get drunk at 9 a.m. Now, 9 p.m., that's a different story, but not at 9 a.m. Because it was the what? The day. So, so that's the literal contextual meaning of it back then. But the spiritual meaning is this. If you are of the day, you are in the kingdom of God. This is why when Paul talks about the Lord appearing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, we are not of those who will be caught off guard because we're sober-minded. We're not in a drunken state spiritually. We're aware, watch this, we're of the day. If you believe in the Lord, you're of the day. If you are a part of the kingdom of darkness, you're of the night. So Jesus says what? He says, are there not 12 hours in the what? In the day. That's what he says in verse 9. But then look at what he says in verse 10. He says what? He says, but if one walks in the night, would you agree with me that Jesus just made a distinction between the day and the night? And if he just made a distinction between the day and the night, and he says there are 12 hours in a day, is it safe to assume there are 12 hours in the night? Which would give us how many hours in the full complete day? 24 hours, which we are accustomed to. God established a day having 24 hours. Way back in Genesis 1, day 1, day 2, day 3, 24 hours. He established a sun and a moon to distinguish between the two time periods that made up the whole of a day. If you all recall, the scripture would read, and the evening and the morning were the first day, the second day, the, th the evening and the morning. So the evening and the morning could also be made synonymous with the day and the night. The day and the night happens to be the morning and the evening, which makes up the whole day. So Jesus just said, what? Are there not 12 hours in the day? Which means automatically that there are 12 hours in the night. So here's our Good Friday pickle. What time is it right now? What time y'all have? About 12, 12, 18. Okay, 12, 18. 24 hours ago, it was 12, 18 on Saturday. But less than 24, as a matter of fact, 13 hours ago, it was Saturday. According to our calendar. 13 hours ago, it was Saturday. But technically, if you did something... 13 hours ago, which would have been around 11, 11, 15 p.m., you technically could say you did it yesterday because it was yesterday. So an understanding of days is that any part of the day is the day. So for the Lord to die on a Friday and be raised on Sunday, watch this, it can compute if you're just referring to any part of the day. That's right. It works. Because you have Friday night, you have all of Saturday, and you have Sunday morning. Therefore, you have three days. So Good Friday would work. Here's why it doesn't work. Because of something not that I said, because of something not even the most elect of apostles said, not a Paul, not a John, not a Peter, something Jesus himself said. Now, this same Jesus who just said, are there not 12 hours in the day, and then makes a distinction between the day and the night, is establishing that in order for you to have a full day, you must have 12 morning hours and 12 evening hours to give you 24 hours. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 12, verses 38 through 40, he says, as Jonah 
was in the belly of the beast three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. In order for you to be in the heart of the earth for both three days and three nights, I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, you can't die on a Friday and be raised on a Sunday morning. I didn't say it. He said it. He's the one who said, are there not 12 hours in the day? He makes a distinction between the day and the night, meaning there are also 12 hours in the night, meaning there are 24 hours in a day. And then he said, I'm going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now, if he would have just said, I'm going to be in the heart of the earth three days, oh, we could make Friday night to Sunday morning work. But he didn't say that. He said, as Jonah was in the belly of the monster for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The math doesn't work, and God invented math. Man didn't create math. God did. Every... every genius discovery of a mathematical solution or, or, or formula was man discovering something God already created. So Jesus, whose God said that he'd be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Now, I'm not going to elaborate on the exact days and the exact nights or the exact mornings and evenings. You got to tune in to Tuesday night Bible study to get all of that. (laughs) Tune in to Tuesday night Bible study and I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to slow walk you through it. For right now, let's just use something that I'd like to call, and not everybody has heard of this. You know that everybody hasn't heard of this because all you have to do is look at the lives of some people, but I'm going to call this common sense. And if we would just apply a little bit of common sense, we can see that you can't get three days and three nights out of Friday night to Sunday morning. Can't do it. Once again, you can get three days, but you can't get three days and three nights. Jesus said it, for it didn't. Look at verse 11. These things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. His sister said he's sick. And then you, Jesus, said this sickness is not to death. But now right here, you're saying Lazarus sleeps, which means Lazarus what? Lazarus died. Did Jesus contradict himself? Absolutely not. Those of us who are seasoned, we know exactly what he just did. We, 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 know, we know what he said when he said this sickness is not to death. And we know what he's saying now when he says Lazarus sleeps. And see, if we, if we go back to what he said about this sickness not being to death, remember that his main point was that God would be glorified in this. Meaning what? Death would not be glorified. Are you with me? He says, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. You all remember the daughter of Jairus who died? And the reason why Jesus didn't make it to her in time is because he encountered the woman with the issue of blood. So by the time he gets to the house, the daughter is dead in human terms. What does Jesus say? Make room. She just sleep. I'm going to wake her up. He says, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. Because that's what rest does. A good night's sleep. Sometimes we don't need medicine. We just need proper sleep. Sadly, improper sleep, can, can, you can go to bed with a headache and wake up still with a headache. Because you didn't get proper rest, proper sleep. So they're right when they said, oh, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. But Jesus was not speaking of sleep, was he? However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. They could have easily been confused and said, well, wait a minute. You just said earlier that this sickness is not unto death. But when he said that, he wasn't saying that 
that Lazarus was not going to die. He was saying that death would not be glorified. God would be glorified through this. Let's keep going. Oh, look at what he says. Jesus, he called somebody. Look at this. Verse 14. Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there so that you can believe. Because what I'm about to do, oh, you can't believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Hmm. What could that mean? Was Thomas making a statement of commitment to Lazarus, someone who was dear to Jesus? Or was he fearful of something? Let's keep going. Verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb. How many days? Uh Uh-oh, we passed three. See, Jesus was in the tomb three days. And, and the, the psalmist by the name of David makes this statement prophetically. He says, you, God, will not allow your holy one to see corruption. What was he talking about? He was saying that the body of the, the slain Savior who would rise, his body would not see corruption. And the body begins to corrupt after how long? Three days. Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. It don't smell too good right now. His body's not looking too good right now. His body has begun. His body started corrupting and decaying. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. She just lost her brother. Mary's grieving. Mary is crushed. Mary is broken. And Martha is going to see the one whom she firmly believes that if he would have been present with them, her brother wouldn't have passed. Look at verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the, in the house. Now, now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But then look at what she says next. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, he'll give you. Okay? Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, what? Watch this. She says, I know that he'll rise again. And then she establishes and makes clear what she's talking about. She says, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Okay, let's let's put a pin here. The resurrection at the last day. Martha was under the old covenant, so her only understanding of the resurrection was after the great and fearful day of the Lord. That's the only resurrection. She's not aware of the church or doesn't have a full understanding of the church because no one did. I mean, in the gospel account, Jesus only mentions the church twice. There is no Old Testament prophet who ever prophesied about the church because they didn't see it because the church was concealed in a mystery. It was Paul who would reveal the understanding of that mystery in his epistles. So what's Martha talking about? She's talking about the end of of everything. She's going all the way to Revelation chapter 20. She's at the very end. She's not thinking about the first resurrection. She doesn't understand that right now. She's thinking about what we now know as the second resurrection or the last resurrection. But to her, it's just the resurrection at the last day. So she says, yeah. This also lets you know she wasn't a Sadducee. Y'all have heard of the Sadducees as well, like the Pharisees, right? Well, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So this lets us know Martha for sure was not a Sadducee. She believes in the resurrection. Watch this now. She says, I know he'll rise again. Right after Jesus says what? Your brother will rise again. She says, I know. I know. I, I, listen, I have faith I have faith in God. I know that I will see my brother again because he will be raised 
at the last day in the resurrection. And then Jesus said to her, hold up one second. He said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I, want, I, I need you to understand something. I want to be very clear right now. He said, I am the resurrection. I am. By the way, our, our title is He is Resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection. Wait a minute. I, I am. Okay. Now, if I'm, if I'm hearing this, I'm trying to compute. You are, what do you, what do you mean here? You are the resurrection. Watch this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall what? Live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die, which lets us know that as believers, death is not the final stage. It is a transition into something else. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So death is not the end. And being present with the Lord in heaven is not the end. Because after we're present with the Lord in heaven, then we come back with the Lord to the earth. To reign with him on the earth. And then after we reign, we go into New Jerusalem to live forever on the earth. So if you believe in Jesus, you will never die. You just have a number of transitions. Look at what he says. Look at 25 and 26 again. Oh, I wish I could hear him say, oh, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He asked the question, do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is to come into the world. Now, we have to, we have to, we have to establish why Jesus said, I am the resurrection. He said, your brother will rise again. Martha thinks he's talking about the resurrection. Jesus says, no, wait, first let me tell you, I am the resurrection. And the reason why he said, I am the resurrection is because he would be the first to be resurrected. See, you need to understand that there is a difference between being resurrected and being raised from the dead. See, if you have been resurrected, you have been raised from the dead. But if you've been raised from the dead, that does not mean you've been resurrected. Watch this. When Adam sinned, the Bible says, for by one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. So death got a foothold into this world as a result of Adam's sin. Fast forward to the book of Hebrews. The Bible says it's appointed for man to die once. And then after that, the judgment. Who, who scheduled all of our appointments with death? I know I didn't schedule my appointment with death because I would have never scheduled an appointment with death. There was one man who represented us all and he made all of our appointments with death. Now, when you come into Christ, you need to understand the power of the word of God and the power of the word of God coming out of your mouth so that when death comes for you, for his appointment with you, you let him know I'm going to reschedule today. Amen. Death, you don't get to tell me when I die. Amen. But that initial appointment was made by who? Adam. So, you have a girl like the daughter of Jairus who what? Died, and then Jesus raised her from the dead. You have a Lazarus here who died, and then Jesus, as we continue to read, he's going to what? He's going to raise him from the dead. There was a place called Nain. There was a widow whose son died, and Jesus raised him from the dead. The widow of Nain's son, the daughter of Jairus and Lazarus, all were raised from the dead, but later on in life died. But when you've been resurrected, you will never die again. When you've been resurrected, you no longer can die. So Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Because Jesus would be the first one to what? Die 
face death, whoop death's tail, take his keys, and then be resurrected, never to die again. The other three whom he raised from the dead died again later on in life. In other words, Jesus rescheduled their appointments with death and made them new appointments for later on in their lives, but they still died because you can be raised from the dead and still have an appointment with death. Oh, but when you're resurrected, you never, you'll never die again. That's why when we participate, that's why Paul gets all gangster in 1 Corinthians 15. He's like, hey, yo, death, where's your sting? Hell, where's your victory? Where you at? He says, this is the saying brought to pass. Death is swallowed up in victory. When we're resurrected, no more death. Jesus even had one better than both Enoch and Elijah. We all know Enoch and Elijah, two amazing figures, patriarchs in Scripture. Enoch and Elijah didn't die. They didn't die. God took them alive. And they ascended to be in the presence of the Lord. And as impressive as that sounds, Jesus one-upped them. Jesus died and with his death, defeated death. And then he got back up, never to go down again. He said, I am the resurrection because I am the first. That's why the Bible calls him the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The firstborn from the dead. That's what it means to be the resurrection. Oh, time is not on my side. All right, let's, let's, let's get to this part right here. Where do we leave off? Verse 28, when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she's going to the tomb, by the way, it's been four days, to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. She said the same thing Martha said. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? They're making all of these statements due to their limited understanding. God's about to show out. Slap the devil right upside his head. Verse 38, when Jesus again groaning in himself came to the tomb, it was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, get rid of the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench because he's been dead for days because we are past corruption now. It don't smell good. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Uh-oh, there it is. This is what Jesus meant the whole time when he said this sickness is not to death. This is going to be about the glory of God. Death will not get the glory. God will get the glory here. Look here, verse 41, and we'll wrap this up. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Shouldn't we do that in prayer? Shouldn't we think? And how do we know he heard us? Because we prayed right. We prayed according to his will. And his word says that if we pray according to his will, he hears us. So, Father, I thank you that you heard me because I'm not making up my own words. I am, I, am, I am vomiting out your words. And since I'm saying your words, I know you heard me. 
because I prayed according to your will. Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me, and I know that you always hear me. Why does God always hear Jesus? Only because Jesus is God? Well, if that's the case, we can't model that. But what we can model is proper prayer. So we can be confident that God always hears us when we pray according to his will. If we're not praying according to his will, he don't be hearing us. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that you, they may believe, ooh, that you sent me. Now watch this. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> and he who had died got up, came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said, what? Loose him and let him go. I want to be very clear why Jesus had to be very specific when he called out the name of Lazarus. Because you're talking about somebody with unlimited power. If he didn't say Lazarus and would have just said, come forth, everybody would have got up. <laughs> everybody would have got up. <laughs> He'd have been like, oh, no, I'm, my bad. Y'all go back. Y'all. Go lay back down. <laughs> that would have been a massive raising of the dead. No, no, this wasn't about everybody at this particular time. This was about who? This was about Lazarus. So he said, well, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, who would, like Martha and Mary and all of the other disciples and those who began the church and all of us who are believers in the church, we will all be resurrected because of the resurrection. We will all be resurrected because of he who is the resurrection. Let's end with this last verse here in 45, because this is what it's ultimately all about. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, what happened? They believed in him. See, Jesus never came so that he can work miracles. That's not why he came. He worked them. But notice he never, everything that he said he came to do had to do with unbelievers becoming believers. He said, the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and life more abundantly. He said, I have not come to call the righteous to repentance. I've come to call the unrighteous to repentance. Every single statement he made about his coming had to do with saving people. Now, in the process of saving people, he worked wonders and signs and miracles, things that no one could dispute or deny. And look at the end result. Many would believe on him. And that's what this day is ultimately all about. Acknowledging our Savior. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Acknowledging our Savior. He who has risen, who has defeated death. He who is the resurrection. But for those of us who already believe in him, we want others to believe in him as well. If you don't know Jesus, let today be your day to know Jesus to come into relationship with Jesus. That's the salvation experience. That's being born of the Spirit, born from above, born again. We don't want anyone to miss out on that. That's why we assembled today. If you've never received the Holy Spirit, hear me now, being saved, Without a doubt, we'll see to it that you do not miss heaven when you pass away. But we know being saved is not just about dying and going to be with the Lord. Because when we get saved, we're still here. That means there's work for us to do as believers in the Lord. And in order to successfully do that work, we must what? We must be filled with the Spirit of God. The early church had to be filled before they could go out and minister the gospel. If you have not received the gift of the Spirit or been filled with the Spirit, let today be your day for that as well. If you're not a part of a local assembly, a local body of believers, you're not here by accident. 
You didn't show up by accident. It wasn't a coincidence. If you want to know that you know that you're saved, you can know today. As well as you know your name and age, we don't want anyone to miss out. I'm going to have everyone repeat after me in just a moment prayers for salvation and to be filled with the Spirit. But for those right now, first, I want to make that offer by a show of hands, if that's you. You'd like to come into the flock of, of God, the, the fold of Christ, the body, the church. You're not a part now, but you would like to be. Here's your opportunity to respond in faith to the call of salvation. Is there anyone under the sound of my voice? Raise your hand high so the ushers can see your hand. You'd like to be saved today. You'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. You'd like to become a part of this local body of believers, this local church. You want assurance of salvation. I see one hand. I see one hand. Is that, is that a second? Okay, I, one for sure. Okay, uh, is there another? Two, I see two, okay. Is that a third? Okay, perfect. Three hands raised as of right now. You may put your hands down. In a, in a minute, I'm gonna have you to come forward. Before I do that, we don't want anyone at home to miss out. We also don't want anyone in person to miss out. There are times where, where, where individuals won't respond because of a number of things, fear or shame. Everyone's looking at me. No problem. We're going to do something together as a family. And once again, we want to make sure we cover all at home. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Many of you are familiar with this, a prayer of salvation, saying, Dear God, you said in your word to repent for the kingdom is near. You said, if I would confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and to believe in my heart that you've raised him from the dead, I would be saved. You said, whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, on this day, I repent of my sins and I do now confess and I do now believe that he is Lord that he took away the sin of the world and that you raised him from the dead. I'm now a part of his church and kingdom, his family and body. He's my savior and Lord, my head and king. I am your child. You are my father and I'll serve you all the days of my life. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. That's to be saved, to be filled with the Spirit. We don't want anyone to miss out on this either. Simply repeat after me, saying, Heavenly Father, I see in your word the early church, the first disciples, they did not go forth preaching the gospel until they received power from heaven. They were filled with the Spirit. They spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Like them on that day, by faith, I receive the gift of the Spirit. I am now filled with the Spirit. I too have received my heavenly language. But most importantly, I'm now a witness for the King and Kingdom in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. If you prayed either of these prayers, for those of you at home, if you prayed these for the very first time, praise God. You're in the family of God, filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. You may wonder what your next move is. If you have questions, you can reach out to us by way of the email address you see on the screen, admin at faithdome.org. We look forward to hearing from you. For those of you in the congregation, if you prayed those prayers for the very first time, I'd ask that you raise your hands. Three hands were already raised. We know we're going to minister to those three. Is there anyone else? We don't want you to miss out any other by a show of hands. You prayed those prayers for the first time. You are now saved. You're now filled with the Spirit. Okay, I don't see any other hands, but three hands were raised earlier, so I'm going to ask those three, make sure you have your, your belongings, what you, what you entered in with. I'm going to ask you to stand up right now. The ushers are going to bring you forward.
I would like you all to do I'm just I'm just observing this as they're walking forward we literally have four generations four different generations all minister to same word same gospel praise God for those of you that have come forward I'm gonna pray with you we're gonna send you to the prayer room I'm gonna ask for the congregation to please stand right now stretch your hands forth surrounding them in an atmosphere of God's agape love his unconditional love those of you that have come forward I want you to lift one hand up to heaven that's symbolic of where your help comes from from above I'll pray father we thank you and we praise you for this time we thank you for this day for this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it and father we rejoice because you rejoice we celebrate because the angels are celebrating your word says that when just one sinner repents, there's joy in the presence of angels. Father, we know there's joy in your presence, even when those who belong to you are filled with your spirit, whom you've given to us to be our help. Those that have found a place where your word is taught and you alone are glorified and those that will leave here knowing they belong to you. I thank you that as they are ministered to, that ministry goes forth effectively and with clarity, all things will be done decently and in order. And Father, we thank you that you have destroyed the works of darkness so that they would not have any say-so in kingdom business. And this right here, this is kingdom business. And for it all, we give you praise, glory, and honor. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Little man, don't, don't drop Sonic. Get Sonic. Thank you so much. Now, if you all would turn, you're going to be the leader. You and Sonic are going to lead these people. Can you handle this? All right, what would Sonic do? Let's turn around and you all are gonna follow this young man and they're gonna lead you this direction. Usher with his hand raised right there, there you go, to the prayer room to be ministered to, praise God. Right. Well, they got her. Thank you all for thank thank you all for rising on this day and coming. I got something. Seniors, there will not be a seniors fellowship this week. Instead, join us Saturday, April 29th here in the Faith Dome at 10 a.m. for the, for the brain lecture. You can go ahead and get this Android out of my hands, please. I appreciate that. All right. Day was perfect. Now it's all messed up. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for showing up. But aren't you glad guys showed up? Now, I have been instructed... Aren't these, aren't these lilies pretty? So, you all know what I'm about to say next. But let all things be done decently and in order. And Carlos, <laughs> once again, I'm going to put it on you. <laughs> yeah, distribute as the spirit leads. And this is going to be the best week of your life in the name of the Lord Jesus. Receive that, Father. We thank you that as we go forth, we go forth in your grace, your divine protection. Uh, you've given your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways, protecting us from all hurt, harm, and danger, lest we dash our feet against stones because we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And we thank you. We thank you that we have ministering spirits ready to minister for us, the heirs of salvation, in the name of the Lord Jesus, y'all pay attention to the prayer and not the flowers. Amen. We'll see you next time.